Hello, Tradman listeners, and welcome back to the program. Tonight's episode is a really, really special one, and it's a very special guest that we have with us. Normally, when we start our episodes, you'll notice that either Jason and I, were, Jason or I, will lead with a prayer. But we decided to let our guest lead the prayer uh, this time. Um, and I would have introduced our guest on the actual podcast, but I was rushing a little bit because I was late to the interview. Um, that was my fault. And I'm very gracious that uh, our guest was patient with us. Our guest tonight was uh, is uh, our uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Uh, he is the uh, he is a Catholic prelate serving as the auxiliary bishop of Astana, Astana, Kazakhstan. He is a member of the Canons Regular of the Holy Cross of Cumbria. He writes and lectures prolifically on the preservation of Catholic tradition and the preservation of authentic Catholic morals and teachings. He is a soldier in the army of Christ, a defender of the faith. We're so blessed to have him on our program. This is going to be a really inspiring episode. You're going to want to listen to this one and stick around to the end of the episode when His Excellency will bestow upon us and all of our listeners the apostolic blessing. We hope so much you enjoy this episode and thank you for watching. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, Tradmen listeners. Thank you so much for uh, being with us uh, on this very special episode. We are incredibly blessed uh, to have Bishop Athanasius Schneider joining us live from uh, from Kazakhstan, and uh, he's going to be discussing his new book, The Springtime That Never Came. And usually, if Tradmen listeners know that at this point we open up with a prayer, but uh, due to uh, our esteemed guest uh, being above us in the hierarchy, we would ask him to to definitely lead us in an opening prayer. Monsignor, at your at your discretion. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Pater noster, qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in celo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. 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 Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. How are you, sir? Thank you. Thank you. Good. So we had an opportunity to dig into your new book called The Springtime That Never Came, a probably a, a, one of the most appropriate titled works that I have read recently. Um, many of us in the Catholic Church, especially those of us who came up in the post-conciliar age, hear a lot about the new springtime of the church and oh what a wonderful springtime we're in it isn't the new springtime wonderful and we look around and we go um i i guess i <laughs> it didn't feel like much of a springtime to us so when i first came across your book i said aha i wasn't wrong i wasn't crazy somebody else sees what i see and not only did you see what i see you saw it with a much more in-depth uh, and I think a more careful analysis in a lot of ways. What was it in, that inspired you to give us this book now? Why, why this book at this time? Well, first, it was not my idea to publish this book mm -hmm. because it was the Polish uh, journalist, uh, Pavel Lisicki from Warsaw, who read my book Christus Vincit, it is a book length, length interview with Diane Montagna and he was in he was inspired by the reading of this my book and he phoned me and asked me 
to grant him uh, uh, an interview book uh, in order to to deepen some aspects of my first book and to discuss further some topics. And so this was his idea and I um, accepted his request. And so I did this second book with him. Well, we're definitely grateful that you did that. Um, and I, coming up, we're about almost a year since Tradiciones Custodes. It would be about another two months since Tradiciones Custodes first came out. And I'm, I'm kind of wanted to take the temperature of what does everybody think the result of, has Tradiciones Custodes gone the way that Francis thought it was going to go? Do you think it has been, that it has kind of blown up in his face? Or do you think that from his point of view, it's largely been successful? I think partly, so at least as as long we, as we can observe the the effect of Tradiciones Custodes, of course, in some places it was very um, strict um, implemented, and this is, we have to regret this in some dioceses, even some bishops did this with, um, in some way, with joy to destroy the tradition, the true tradition, not the, um, because unfortunately, uh, those bishops and even Pope Francis recently, they say we have not to be attached to the traditions, to the dead traditions. But this venerable right, which uh, at least one millennium, we have the texts of the Mass, the order of the Mass, since the beginning of the second millennium, from the times of Pope Innocent the, the, the Third, the time of St. Francis, for example. Um, this is a long time. It, exactly the same right. It was not the Tridentine right. It was the same before the Council of Trent, exactly the same. So it is not an invention of a council or of Pope Pius V. It was simply handed over and Pope Pius V only made small uh, changes in the Missal, not in the order of the Mass. And so, and this cannot be a, a, a that a tradition what the saints lived and, and loved. So that traditions are those who are fashions of the day, uh, as today, they, uh, who are attached to purely human traditions which are going away uh, very quickly. So this is, and therefore, we have to keep this true tradition of the church, of the liturgy, of the saints and of the centuries. In other places, uh, some bishops did apply this traditionis custodes in a broader way, uh, more generously, thanks be to God. And, and many de facto, some do not strictly apply this or, or observe these norms, thanks be to God. Because this uh, Pope Francis, with this motto proprio, he is not able to to destroy this venerable liturgy. He is not able. This venerable liturgy is stronger than a single pope or a current persecution. The more it will be persecuted, the more it will flourish. This is a law because it is not a purely human tradition, I repeat. It is a tradition which the Holy Spirit um, um, filled and, and guided in the church through centuries. And therefore, we have to be confident, trustful that this will continue, maybe in a more uh, modest way, uh, uh, temporarily, but it will continue. Your Your Excellency, <clears throat> uh, 
on this topic, a, a lot of those within the hierarchy and even among the laity like to say we need to move away from tradition for the sake of progress. And I know in your book you talk about uh, progress and you, 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 know, you, you bring up very good points about uh, Pope John the Twenty Third and his jovial outlook on the world. And it seems to be that there was people were conflating technology, technological progress with the progress of humanity. And what I got from that was as well is that when we look at progress, progress doesn't always mean that it's a positive. Would you, would you say that's a fair assessment that just because something falls under the domain of progress, that doesn't necessarily make it a good. Of course, it, it depends what in which direction you, you progress, you, you go. So when you are approaching an abyss, it is not positive, this progress. So, <laughs> uh, and, well said. And, uh, and so it is the, depending in which direction you are going. And the only progress is if we individually in our life or the society is progressing, is approaching and advancing no, uh, to the good, to the what is good objectively, what is true, what is beauty. These three characteristics are given by God, uh, um, inscribed in the human nature and in nature, uh, what is true, what is good, what is beauty. This is the natural law which God gave human nature. And, and then his commandments are, are true, the commandments of God leads us to the to the happiness so to the true happiness lasting happiness and therefore only those measures and signs which which will approach us more or which are which will strengthen us in in the truth in the good and not not and reminding us our last aim to which we are going, to which, for which we are created, the eternal life, eternity, the eternal happiness with God after this life. So only such a progress, which, which will help to, to easier achieve this our aim, our true aim of the eternity, of eternal life, and pleasing God, this will be a true progress all other signs, even good, let us say the techniques today, we have so many in say uh, good uh, achievements in, in the technology, but if they will not help us to come closer to God, uh, this will not help us. Mm, that's very well put. I, I, when I think about progress, and especially as you wrote about it in the springtime that never came, I thought about the Garden of Eden. And I thought, you know, it must have seemed like we're about to progress. We're going to be as gods. And so we're going to achieve progress. Quote, and, and the result of that is the same as it, as it always is. You sit in ashes and bones in, in the end. Um, and we seem to be in an age that is obsessed with progress as a watchword, but it very often doesn't mean that. And um, that is particularly true in, in a world that sees the only way to human happiness is just uninhibited sexual license and nothing else. Nothing else will bring a human being happiness. You talk a lot about that in your book. What do you, what do you make of a world that is, I would say, obsessed in a, in a very strange way with sexual license? Uh, what, what, how how can what does the what is an authentic catholic way a to look at our our sexual faculties as gifts from god and how do we respond to a world that sees perversion and 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 death and destruction as good things how can we how can we as catholics evangelize to that world well first maybe we can start with the natural law with nature and then 
uh, the, the nature is created by God. So God created our sexuality, not the devil and not to be self. This is a work of creation. And what God created is good in uh, and beauty. So, but the problem of the sexuality is the, the wrong use of something. So uh, it can be something good, but when you are using it in a wrong way, it can be damaging you. Mm -hmm. And so the same, let, uh, the most basic uh, example, or uh, it is our freedom. God gave us the faculty of freedom of to choose. And this is, uh, this is showing our dignity. They are created to the image of God. But Adam and Eve abused the faculty of freedom, of choosing the good, and they had chosen the bad. And so, therefore, this is the problem. And the same with the sex, our sexuality. Uh, the problem is that this is abused so oftentimes by people. And um, also the fact that by through original sin, which we inherit, from our first parents, Adam and Eve, uh, this um, faculty given by God, the sexuality, is deeply wounded also. Mm -hmm. It's in itself a wound. And uh, this is called the concupiscence. This is a tendency against reason. So to use this faculty against reason and um, in, in not the right way, so not in a measured way. And this is the, the concupiscence. And the concupiscence in this area of sexuality is um, an expression of, of self, selfishness, selfishness, mm -hmm. uh, uh, egoism centered only to you. So to only to have something for you. And this is also the, this problematic in the sexuality that this is wounded. We are not, and this is that today, even in within the church, this spreading of this heresy of Pelagianism, which is said we are not wounded. Our nature is okay, and all what we are feeling, even our sexuality, and so it is always good. It's not always. Good. It is wounded, and therefore we have to control this, to have a discipline, like a horse, uh, when a wild horse is running. Uh, you have to, uh, as, as um, when you are on a horse, you have to discipline the horse. Otherwise, it will carry you in, in directions which you don't want, or even throw you uh, down. So it is like a horse. We have to, and when you discipline a good horse, he can good a lot. He can do a lot of good, good things for you. But we have to train to discipline, and this is the problematic. Human being do not want to discipline the sexuality. Mm. We have to to recognize with humility we are wounded, and and God gave us our reason. God gave us our freedom, and then of course. God gave us, of course, this force uh, is so strong that it cannot be ultimately uh, disciplined and, and uh, without the grace of God, without the help of God. And therefore, God gave us the, his help. He is so merciful. Uh, and, uh, the people abused this gift of God because it is connected to life giving. So sexuality is always connected to life, mm. to giving some to the life, not, mm -hmm. to, not to, to have something for me only, uh, egoistic. This is the contrary to the sexuality. Sexuality is given by God and planned and designed as a faculty always, always connected to life, life-giving. And therefore, 
all use of sexuality uh, outside the, this given context and this uh, frame of God, which is life-giving and life-giving only in a valid marriage and family, which God established, this is the place to, to transmit life and to exercise this faculty which God gave. And therefore, all uh, acts which are outside uh, the use of sexuality, outside a valid marriage, is contrary to the will of God, and therefore grievously bad. And then also without, even within the, the valid marriage, can be abuse of this faculty also, with contraception uh, or other tricks uh, only to have your pleasure without the connection to life directly. So this is the wise. And then you will be happy when we are even in this. It, 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 it is uh, with God's help we can. Therefore, God gave us this help. Uh, the saints say in the church, pray. When you have not, when you are uh, not strength, then pray to God, and and with confidence and with patience, and He will give you. And sometimes it is necessary to to use also uh, some um, special measures. Let us say penance, fasting, or prayer to dominate this and this is so important and then you will be really happy and, and peaceful with the grace of God but especially the sacraments the Holy Eucharist the confession Our Lady so the the, the devotion to Our Lady in any case it is um, a gift of God but I see we see today it is an attack against the plan of God it is the the these sins against uh, the chastity, it is an attack against God's commandment and God's wise plan and ultimately an attack against life and against the, the holy marriage which God created. And I've, I and did, go ahead, Jason. No, no, I, I just wanted to, to ask, you know, uh, his your book speaks to so many what would be called hot button issues, hot topics today. And you, you had mentioned earlier, you, you spoke about freedom. And I also know in your book, you, you, you speak about uh, the freedom of religion and this, uh, it seems like there's ecumenicalism run amok that, uh, you know, uh, the Holy Father has, I don't know if he, I don't remember if he said it verbatim, but has made, made it seem like proselytizing, Protestants or Muslims or those not of the Catholic faith would be wrong, right? So we in the United States, we live in a country where people are constantly preaching freedom of religion. <clears throat> so when, when it comes to that, people typically conflate, me and Mark have talked about it, they, they really confuse what a freedom and what a right is. And they they, they seem to think they're the they're the same thing. Like I have the freedom, I have the right to do do this. When it comes to worshiping God, for say people like me and Mark in the United States, where there isn't a, a state religion, and there is this idea of a freedom of religion, what would be the appropriate response for us as Catholics? Is that something that we should that we should for the sake of uh, I guess unity as a country. Should we, should we, in our in our private lives, be against it? But but for public policy, say, oh, we we support freedom of religion, or should we be pushing for something something more, something more, uh, you know, state focused on the on the Catholic faith itself? Well, one thing is the principle, the principle which God created, that uh, there is only one true religion, that there cannot be two or three. And this is the Catholic faith, which, and this God, uh, God asks, demands of every human being on earth to accept, of course, freely, not by force, freely, his 
uh, his son Jesus Christ as the savior, the only savior and the only truth and, and the church which God established. This is the way which everyone has. And therefore, uh, also the society as such is created by God. It cannot be atheistic and neutral. It is. It would be uh, contrary. Uh, even uh, the, the the rulers of the states are cre creatures of God, not of the devil or creatures of something neutral. No, they are always creatures of the same God, who commands the only one religion, the truth, is the Catholic faith, and therefore a state as such also has the duty to venerate his creator. We have only one creator, we have not two creators, one creator for the civil life and the other creator for our private life. It is, it is Manichaeism, it, it, it would be Gnosticism. And therefore, uh, as God established humanity entire, has to venerate God, of course. And even the state, uh, and to and this is only one religion. This is the truth and the principle. But the, if, since we are living in a world which is dominated by the prince of this world, I mean by the devil also, and the consequences of the original sin, God tolerates even our personal sins. Uh, God tolerates when we are doing wrong. He is not uh, destroying us immediately or killing us. We are, even people are doing, God tolerates in some way, or I mean, he is uh, permitting this. And of course, until the last judgment, or then, then he will judge us. But still now he, he is, in his wisdom, permits. But he, he does not, like and want our our sins in a way in the same with the religions different religions God permits that the, these errors are exi exist and and therefore it depends on the historical circumstances of uh, as let us say when in the United States there is the, the rulers there are they, they say that we have to be separated uh, and to give all the religions freedom. This is in the Constitution of the United States. So we cannot go directly against this because it will be not realistic uh, as Catholics. Uh, but we have to say that the principle is this. It's only one religion in the States. In principle, even the President of the United States, the Senate, the Congress, all have to venerate God and give him honors, public honors, and to Jesus Christ. To who? To which God? <laughs> there is only one God. And, and who is this one God? Not simply one God. It is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Most Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. And to the Most Holy Trinity, even the, pre, the President of the United States, as such as a President, or from France and so on, have to give public honors because he is a creature of God. He cannot say, I am not a creature of God. And also uh, to worship and to promote the, uh, the truth, the only one truth, which is the Catholic faith. This is the principle, of course, but de facto they, it's not possible in the United States or in other countries or in Muslimic countries, or communist countries. Therefore, we have to, to live in such an environment which the, the politic, like the first Christians in when the, there was a pagan empire, uh, empire uh, and transmit our faith uh, in another way. So, in a missionary way, with love, with conviction, so that slowly the society will be penetrated with the truth, with the Catholic faith. Uh, so, but if there is a country where the majority are Catholics, the overwhelming majority, so it is a question of simply justice, of natural justice, that 
the government, who is representing the majority of the population, uh, should also uh, profess and, uh, and show publicly the Catholic faith. So it, it it so what I what I'm gathering from there is that you know we, we have many of our politicians and even some within the hierarchy try to say that you can live basically a double life but but what you're saying here is as Catholics even in these countries where the Catholic faith is not the majority we need to be living out that principle in every aspect of our lives we don't need to be making that separation like like many are or leading us to believe is is the right thing to do. Right. And, uh, I know that when I came into the church, uh, when I converted back in 2018 and ever since then, I've heard, heard about it. There's been this real big push for universalism. Like it doesn't matter what you believe. Everybody's, everybody's good. Um, as long as you're a good person or, or whatever the case may be. So I know, I know for us, it, it makes it hard as lay Catholics to get out there and evangelize and teach people when, when you have some within the church who are undermining you by going behind you and telling these people, Oh, it doesn't matter what God you serve. It's all the same. And uh, your book brings that clarity and, and, and going back to what you just said, there's only one God. And, and that's the principle that we need to live our lives on. Exactly. Yeah. This, what you mentioned, this behavior of these churchmen, it is uh, undermining the truth, and this is undermining the entire gospel. And Jesus Christ said, I am only the only one way. I am the only door, the gate. There is no other. And all who came before me are robbers and thieves. And he's the only one, pastor and shepherd. So we have to, and he said, the apostles go to, to all nations, to all. So inclusively the Jewish people, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Hinduists, to all. Without exception. And proclaim the gospel. So the, the revelation of God. And and command, teach them. So it is a teaching. So And, and, and uh, teach them to observe all what I have spoken to you and commanded you, not only spoken, commanded our Lord. So this yeah. is the task, yeah. of course, for, uh, for the hierarchy first, but for every Catholic and, and lay person has to have this desire to preach the truth, to transmit the truth to all who are not believing, not Catholics, because if you are, when you are convinced that this is the only one truth, and this only makes you happy, truly, here on earth, you cannot simply say, oh, I will keep this for me. This, is, this would be egoistic. It would be a lack of love for your neighbor. And God will right. judge you one day, say, why you had only uh, kept this treasure for yourself? Like the in the in the parable in the gospel of this when God when the Lord gave to these three um, servants different amount of money to, to one he gave ten to another five coins to the another one and these kept only for him this and then he was judged and the same will be therefore we have the obligation. It too, uh, of course, according to our possibilities and where we are living and according to our state of life, but nevertheless to transmit this truth to those who have to do not have this. So we have to again and and say to them there is no because only one truth. There cannot be uh, the same time the same truths, because the first commandment of God is valid, always. You have not to have other gods, other cults, other worships beside me. This is valid, and, and the entire gospel is in the same. Jesus Christ said there is no other way. And uh, St. Paul writes, who is not believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
will be condemned and the wrath of God will remain upon him of everyone who is not believing in Jesus Christ. This writes St. Paul and this is Holy Scripture and this is the word of the Holy Spirit. Indeed. Well, I've always, I've always felt like the, the prince, like that's what, that's what the sin of Freemasonry was about was that I think they were, their sort of deal is, well, all really, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what religion you are. I mean, I don't know of any, uh, do you think that the Muslims believe that? Do you think that, uh, you know, of course not. And so to say something like it, the only way that they that all the religions can be the same is if they're all wrong, because if you have two that believe mutually exclusive things, they can both be wrong, but only one can be right. I've always felt like uh, that that when people ask, well, what's the big deal with Freemasonry? Why is that? Why is that such a big deal? And I've I've, I've always felt like it's it's the it's the way that they talk about freedom of religion as it doesn't matter what religion you belong to. Um, I want to pivot for a moment to another section of the book that that was very poignant and very powerful, and it changed my changed the way I looked at this subject, and that's priestly celibacy. There are a lot of I think well meaning Catholics. Uh, these are not modernists that I'm talking about. I'm talking about well meaning Catholics who look at priestly celibacy and say it's a discipline. It's not a doctrinal thing. And maybe it, maybe it is time to to do away with mandatory celibacy in the Roman Rite. Uh, maybe that would be beneficial to the church and somehow. And as well-meaning as and well-intentioned as these individuals are, um, it, it's not a complete way to look at this subject. And I feel like the way that you talked about it in in the chapter on this was it was so incredibly helpful because I myself have struggled. Uh, ex at least explaining or talking about this issue. So what would you say to someone who is a well-meaning, well-intentioned Catholic who says, hey, it's a discipline. Maybe it is time for it to change and maybe the church would benefit from that somehow. What would be your response to that? It is not only discipline. It is discipline, but also uh, apostolic tradition, which mm. is so so old and so rooted in the example of our Lord himself and the apostles that the church has no right, no, no pope, no council to abolish de facto uh, the, uh, the celibacy, the priestly celibacy in the church. I say de facto because when they will introduce the so-called facultative or uh, celibacy for choice, it is an abol this abolition de facto. So, and therefore, uh, uh, let us say there are traditions which which are touching the discipline, uh, but are apostolic, and church cannot forbid them or or undermine them. Let us say the the baptism of the babies, the little children, mm -hmm. the infants. Uh, uh, this is not directly commanded as such in the gospel to, to baptize infants explicitly, but it is an apostolic tradition. It is, um, and let us say, when then will come a pope or a council and say, oh, let us uh, change this, this only discipline matter, let us uh, establish a new rule in the Catholic Church that they will be baptized. Baptism can only be administered to, to children, of course children, but when they will start to use their reason, let us say the usual age, six, seven years, when they go to start to go to school, when they start to, to the age of reason, as it's called. So, sure. Uh, six, six or seven years or five. So, and, and not the babies, let us say, the infants, but only when the child starts to think. I think that the church would not have the power to establish such a new rule of baptism of children, abolishing the infant baby, baby baptism. It, it would be, uh, contra, it would be, uh, 
against the, the tradition of the apostles. And in the same parallel, I think that the priestly celibacy is so deeply rooted in the Holy Scripture, in the divine uh, even revelation, and that the church cannot simply reduce these to a disciplinary question. As, as I repeat, our God gave in the Old Testament divinely given rule. It is divinely. So not only disciplinary, that priests, even the Old Testament, when they are, when during their service at the temple, they had to be celib celibatarian, at least uh, a time. Sure. Uh, and then uh, when they will not exercise the priesthood, they could have uh, to live a, a marital life oh. with their wives. So it was a rule in the Old Testament given by God not by by human being, human tradition. So, and our Lord Jesus Christ established the new priesthood. It's not the Old Testament, which is the, the perfection of the Old Testament priesthood. And so, therefore, the continence, sexual continence, during the exercise of the priesthood is in the New Testament always, day and night. He is a priest forever, according to the to the Melchizedek, to the New Testament, and and the priest is always celebrating holy mass uh, and administering the sacraments. This is also contained in some way in the Eucharist, and this kept uh, the, the church, even the Orthodox churches or the Oriental churches, uh, uh, which abolished uh, the celibacy in the seventh century and went away from the older apostolic tradition, even they are keeping this rule until now that when a priest is celebrating Holy Mass, Holy Eucharist, the night before, he has to have continence, sexual continence. So mm -hmm. he has to, at least when he's celebrating Mass, he has to be sexually continent. But the Catholic priest has to celebrate every day the Holy Mass, so it's and give the sacraments. So he has to be to live always in continence, in virginity, in chastity, in celibacy. This is so logic, and because Jesus Christ is the high priest, and the priest is a, a second Christ in this way, Alter Christus, and Christ was virginal. And Christ offered his sacrifice as a virgin, virginally. Uh, and therefore the cry and, and therefore the priest has to also to show the priesthood of Christ in this way, in a visible way. And and then uh, the eff efficacy of the the church was most the, the, the moments of the greatest missionary um, results or works in the history of the church, who made? This was the celibatarian priests and the monks, the greatest missionaries who uh, just look at the 2,000 years story, uh, mm -hmm. history. The greatest missionaries were celibatarian or, or religious priests and monks and bishops. And I think when we look at it that way, when you look at it that way, priestly celibacy doesn't, it doesn't look like a burden. It looks like such a beautiful expression of, of a life of service, a life lived in the imitation of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said, when I, when I read that chapter of your book, it opened that subject up to me in a way I don't think I had ever looked at that before. Agreed. Yeah. And it 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 was definitely it definitely recommitted. I mean, obviously, I am as a lay person and I am married, but uh, in, in it committed me to a redefense of priestly celibacy, maybe in a way that I wasn't before. And so for I that, only, I will be eternally I would, grateful. I would only add a small history, which I already Please. Um, wrote in the book Christus Lynchit. With this theme, once uh, I traveled in, in, in train here in Kazakhstan, and my site was a Muslim, an mm -hmm. older man, a very practicing Muslim. Mm -hmm. And you know, they have 
they, they can have four wives. They was yeah. right. Yeah. And and he, uh, I was dressed as a priest, and he recognized me as a Catholic priest, and he asked me, "Oh, tell me, uh, the the Catholic priests uh, have to observe celibacy?" I said, "Yes." And for how many? Which period of celibacy? How many years celibacy? How many days? <laughs> I said, no, it's not a question of days and years. It is forever, all the life. Oh, I didn't know this. This is very strange for me. How? We Muslims, we can have four wives when we want. And you cannot, cannot have even not one wife? I said, no. Oh, I am pity for you," he said to me. <laughs> and can you can you can you explain this to me? And, uh, I was thinking, how can I explain to this Muslim man, who who even likes to have four wives at the same time, his conviction because the Prophet uh, Muhammad had also several wives, and this is commanded. This is allowed by God. This is okay. Well. I said to him, look, why we are celibatarian all the, all the, the life? Because uh, I am not married to be completely free and dedicated to God mm. and to the souls, to the people, day and night also, day and night. 24 hours completely free and to dedicated to God and to the people. And he was hearing this, and then he said, Oh, what a beautiful style of life. Mm. Oh, this Praise is God. beautiful. A Muslim, Praise an God. older man, he was he had a sincere heart, I think. Yeah. And and this I will never forget. A Muslim, he said. What a beautiful style of life, day and night, even the night, to be completely and always at the disposal of only of God and for the souls. Beautiful. A beautiful definition of celibacy, which gave me a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did want to add while we're on this subject because when me and Mark probably about a week before I read this book um, and came across this chapter, this. This chapter on celibacy what was literally feels like to me an answer from God to my questions that I was having on celibacy because me and Mark had had exchanged text messages about a week before. And I had brought up the idea that I've, I've supported celibacy, but this idea that has been, I guess, hammered away about that it's a discipline. I told Mark, I said, I support it, but I don't know that it's a hill to die on. And we started reading St. Paul's letters where he talks about the, the husband of one wife and, and all that. And then, so, so we had a discussion there and then we started looking at what the church father said. We started reading St. John, John Chrysostom, St. Basil and everything. So their explanations of the, the husband of one wife was very clear. And then I come across your book. And when I read your answer to that, particularly when you said that when Jesus offered the sacrifice uh, uh, continent and then, you know, you, you make that transition to the priests making the sacrifice of the mass, you know, representing it uh, to God and continent. It was just like, OK, well, this is a hill, hill to die on. This is something that is of the utmost importance, even though it may be, as they say, a discipline. Your your historical uh, uh, knowledge on it really kind of hammered it home for me, and it was almost like an answer from God saying, "No, this this is that important." And I and I've told people this before when I've talked about I, I I tell people there really is only one priest in the whole Catholic Church, and they say, "What do you mean there's only one priest?" I said, "There's only one priest, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the priest of the Catholic Church." And Monsignor Athanasius and, and Father Van Fleet at our parish, what these men are doing is by the sacrament of holy orders, they are participating in Jesus's priesthood. And so it does make a lot of sense that they should, in every way possible, attempt to conform themselves perfectly to, to be alter Christus and 
And so that was such a beautiful explanation of that. Um, very, very beautiful. And I, I just, I thank you so much for that. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, the current state of the Catholic church. And, and this can be a, a, a somewhat difficult subject and I don't mean it to be, but I am often, I look at the world today as a world that is at war with categorization. You're not allowed to have categories. You can't say things like, man, that's a man and that's a woman. You can't say things like that's this and that's that. That's a dog. That's a tree. You can't say those things. And in a world like that, one struggles to wonder why the Vatican thinks that the principal problem in the world is rigidity. And I'm thinking rigidity. We're not even allowed to say that what is what things are what what in the world do we mean so i i'm curious as to your take on why do we constantly hear about rigidity and and what are they talking about and is is that really the problem in the world today no the contrary <laughs> it is the the how do you say the permissivity that you allow all uh, and you undermining the constant truth and which God gave. This attack against the so-called rigids, it is a hidden uh, agenda uh, to promote relativism of truth and to relativize Jesus Christ and the divine revelation ultimately. We have to be very honest and say this, and but these same people who are accusing the, the faithful who are keeping their faith and the, the liturgy of the saints um, as rigid, they are very rigid themselves because in a way they are persecuting the traditional liturgy. It is rigid. So mm -hmm the norms of traditionis custodes are re really a demonstration of such a intolerance and rigidity, it is obvious. So, And then, the same who are against rigidity, they are very rigid when it comes to the issue of their finances and of their personal account <laughs> and of their wages and salaries. So they will count every small indeed amount of money and they're very rigid they will be very rigid to, to take accountability of this or they are very rigid in observing the police is very rigid to observe the rules of the traffic so when you are uh, not observing the the traffic rules so it's very rigid but indeed. it is necessary because otherwise we will have a lot of more accidents on the roads which we already have accidents. But when you are not observing, then you are uh, damaging. And, so, and the more it is dangerous when in the spiritual uh, uh, life, the life of the true life, it is the spiritual life, which will lasting. And when in this sphere, you are not observing the rules which God gave, this, this will do the spiritual accidents. And this is the undermining of truth, of faith, weakening the faith, heresies, and so on. This is the danger. And so, therefore, when Pope Francis is speaking about rigidity, uh, it is very ambiguous. So, And we have to keep the truths when we are transmitting what is good, what is true, what is beauty. It can never be rigid. It is a benef benefice. It is uh, for, for the next generation. So how can you be accused when you are uh, keeping, transmitting something which is beauty, which is true, mm. which is holy? This can never be. And uh, when you are protecting your house uh, and your family uh, against the possibility of being robbed uh, or thieves, as a father of family, you are not rigid. It is your duty to protect your house, your children. Even this, when you will rigid and strict 
because you will not allow to enter people in your house to to corrupt your children or to to rob your property uh, and therefore the same the church the pope the bishops has to be such as good family fathers who are defending their children in their house and not allowing to enter uh, wolves who will under the pretext of oh let us be not rigid so let us enter let us allow enter everyone who wants no 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 family father will do this even those family fathers who are against the so called rigidity rigidity they will not allow enter everyone in their house no I have a, a question from one of our listeners who um, that I thought was very beautiful and I thought would be a great question uh, for you. For you. Um, and he writes, uh, Your Excellency, we are at a point in this pontificate where he feels that the credibility of the papacy is very much um, uh, uh, attacked. Um, most Catholics are not sure that they're what they are supposed to believe and the Pope's speeches and writings, and be because of the lack of true catechesis and teaching over the last 50 years, there is a serious lack of supernatural faith in most of the clergy, and therefore the laity is not inspired. I believe the FSSP at our parish offers a small dose of sanity each week at Mass that we can't get anywhere else. There is peace in our hearts as we go to Mass and spend those few hours with Christ and our fellow parishioners. The rest of the week is filled with confusion, uncertainty, dismay, and disarray that the father of lies pours upon us. He says, I'm not sure I have a, a specific question for the good bishop, but is there are there any words of encouragement or hope that he could offer that might be helpful to the faithful in these times? That comes from Drew. Thank you. Yes. We have to have always a supernatural view and vision because the church is not a human organization. The church is a divine human organization. So, and ultimately the church is in the hands of Christ, not in the hands of the Pope. It is in the hands of Christ. The Pope is not the successor of Christ, please. The Pope is only the vicar of Christ. Mm -hmm. So not the successor. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, <laughs> he is, yes. He is only the vicar. And so, um, and, um, God permits this, so we have to simply say, oh, my Lord, you permit it that I'm living in such a confused time when even the Pope is spreading ambiguities and, um, and undermining some truth. It is difficult that the Supreme Shepherd or my bishop or, or priest, and therefore, if you permit it, this, this has a meaning for me. Because God is wise and God permits the evils only to, to draw from the evils a greater good. What is the greater good for me? That I am strengthened in my faith. Simply and say, I will keep the same faith with, which I know from the catechism, from the life of the saints. I have the Eucharist, our Lord is the living Lord there in the tabernacle, in the Holy Host. Mm -hmm. He is there. He is living. He is with all his powerful majesty there. I will go to him. And, uh, and so I have all, and I will pray for the Pope and for the other shepherds that they may regain their, the fourth and the strength or that God will again send us courageous apostolic man mm. on the chair of Peter and on the other episcopal chairs and priesthood. And he will do this because it is his church. It's not our church. And this is a time of trials for me. So I accept this with humility. And the Lord will reward me in the eternity with more, more rewards that because I lived in such a difficult time. Uh, I, God is so good. He will give us eternal rewards only because we, are, we have passed through a very difficult time in the church. Mm. And, and no prayer which we are doing is in vain. 
So we have to pray for a new Pope, for new bishops, and offer our sacrifices in a spirit of penance, of trust. Uh, so this is the only meaning. So, and the other way, we have not to forget that even in the, in the hierarchy, the, the parable of the field, our Lord said the church is the field with wheat, and also among the wheat is the the chef, how do you say, the, the bad plant. The chef. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and this, this uh, field of wheat and chef, it is applied also to the hierarchy. Also in the, among the hierarchy are wheat and chef, among the bishops, among the priests. And it goes even to the papacy also. It is not spared. Uh, of course, this, uh, and so, in some times, God permits this. So we had, thanks be to God, uh, in the history of the church, the majority, overwhelming majority of the popes were doing good, their ministry, and their saints, and, or courageous uh, and popes, but sometimes not. And this is then, it was the parable of wheat and chaff, and the same in the episcopacy among the bishops, among the cardinals, among the priesthood, and among the faithful. So, but the, 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 the field is the field of the Lord, and there is also wheat. And so we have to trust and pray. And the church is invincible. Even I think this truth, which our Lord uh, proclaimed that the gates of hell will, will not prevail against the church. This, this is for us uh, a trial. We have to believe in these truths, notwithstanding this confusion which are now coming from the center, the visible center of the church in the Rome. It is temporarily. It's only a, a question of time. A temporarily confusion. It will again, Rome will again shine brightly, of course. Mm, that was beautiful. That was, be I don't know about you, Jason, but I'm ready to run through a brick wall. <laughs> um, closing thoughts, really quick. And I wanted to just wrap up our discussion because we're coming up on an hour and I really appreciate your time. Talk a little bit about Our Lady's role. In, in all of this, what, what devotion to our Blessed Mother means in terms of our, uh, our fight against evil, especially in these times. Yes. Our Lady, she is the most powerful because she is the immaculate, the pure, and the most filled with God, the closest to God. And God gave, and she's the most humble creature. And God gave to the most humble, to the most pure, his power to crush the head of the devil, of the serpent. And she is doing this with all her humility and beauty and uh, purity. So, and motherly love, she is our mother, not to forget it. She is the mother of the church and a loving mother, the most loving mother. And she is also the most powerful mother, powerful. So, mm. and therefore, the church venerates her throughout the centuries as the, the one uh, which um, defeated, uh, conquered all heresies, mm. who destroyed all heresies. This is a title of Our Lady. And she is the the well-ordered battle formation. Uh, this is called Acies Ordinata in Latin. She is the well-formed battle formation. And so we, we, we have this queen. Uh, she is our captain, our commander. Okay, of, of course, with St. Michael, the archangel. But St. Michael is the servant of Our Lady. She is the queen of the angels. And so 
look, we have a very powerful army and we are, we have to be uh, more aware and conscious fighters. And therefore, the Lord gave us Our Lady, Our Mother, and she is coming when the children are in danger. The mother is, is going to help them. And so she, but we have to invoke her. And God gave uh, to our time a special invocation, uh, a special devotion, which God gave through Our Lady in Fatima, the devotion of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And this is the will of God, as Our Lady told in Fatima, to promote this to the Immaculate Heart, the devotion and our consecration and the, the rosary. So I think we have to, to, to make more chains of rosaries. So recently was beatified Blessed Pauline Jaricot, a French virgin uh, who lived in the world in the 19th century. And she was, she had a missionary zeal and, 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 and the soul. And she, she, she founded the Society of the Propagation of Faith for Missionaries and the so-called Living Rosary. So a group of 15 persons, everyone takes a, a mystery of the rosary mm -hmm. between because of not 20, because 15 is the symbol of 150 psalms in the Holy Scripture. Mm -hmm. So the rosary is this, the Marian psal, psaltery, psaltery. Mm. Interesting. Of course, it, it is since the beginning of the, this devotion in the Middle Ages, it is the symbol, symbol of 150 Ave Maria, like the 100, 150 psalms. And this is the Marian Psalms, Psalterium. Therefore, have to be 150, not 200, 150. And therefore, five, uh, 15 uh, mysteries. Of course, you can change this with the luminous also, but it, the, the symbolic has to be 150 or 15 uh, in the biblical symbol. Mm -hmm. and, and the tradition, I mean. Uh, well, so I would encourage to make these groups of, of, of living rosary to make, uh, let us say, 15 persons to distribute the mysteries, let us say, for, uh, for one month and then change the mysteries or for a week. It depends on your possibilities. But with specific intention, let us make these, these ro rose, 15 ro roses, uh, a bouquet of 15 roses and with a specific intention to pray for that God will grant the church a new courageous 100% Catholic Pope. Mm. <laughs> Why not? This is very important. The rose, completely, make a living rosary, a living rose, 15, and then other can make for the specific intention. Please, our Lord, grant us a Pope who will defend the faith, who will keep the, the holy tradition as the Peter did, as the holy popes did in history. And God will hear Our Lady, she is our loving mother. And the prayer of the rosary is the most powerful means in our days which, which the providence of God gave us. And therefore, I would encourage this. I, you, you know what I noticed when when the good bishop was talking about Mary, all uh, the the beautiful blessed Virgin. All three of us were smiling at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I I I remember. So I I usually lead the rosary at the beginning of of our mass of, at at the mass that I attend, and I always throw in a special intention um, for a special intercession of our Blessed Lady of Guadalupe for the protection of human life. I have never thought much about that. And then very recently, we found out that the Supreme Court is going to overturn Roe versus Wade. Never, never discount Our Lady. She is <laughs> never discount Our Lady because uh, she is, she is, God is working. God exactly. is working. Exactly. Um, your, well, your, your excellency, did, Jason, did you want to have some parting thoughts? I'm sorry. I well, it's not really, it's not really the parting thoughts, but since I had, um, uh, uh, the good bishop here. I just kind of want to make a couple comments first. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for coming on. I mean, yes. I've, I know I have definitely benefited from this and I hope anybody that listens to it 
benefits from it as well. You're a very, uh, very wise man who, uh, who is easy to tell has a good heart for the, for the faith. Um, what, just the comments I was going to make that I, I, I found out not too long ago, we have one of our, so we attend a fraternity parish here in Houston, Regina Chaley. I believe, I believe you may have, uh, celebrated mass here yes. in, in the right. past, yes. but, um, one of our priests, Father Rock, he was ordained by Bishop Athanasius Snyder, uh, I believe in 2019. And yes. Father Rock is a very good, very holy priest. So, my greetings uh, to him. <laughs> my, my greetings. <laughs> well, I definitely pass it on. I know we talked this uh, this past Sunday for a little bit about New Jersey versus New York pizza, but uh, <laughs> I'll I'll pass the message on in. I always found it, uh, you know, before I converted uh, back in 2018 and 2017, I actually spent some time in Kazakhstan for work over in uh, over in Oktau doing uh, some work. And we still do work there. So maybe one day if I if I ever uh, go over there for work again, maybe I'll end up in, in, in you are, your city. <laughs> you are welcome to my city in Nur Sultan, in the capital. Uh, uh, well, we have to to inform me in advance because sometimes I am traveling and not oh. to the place. But you are welcome. And we have uh, very holy places, especially in Karaganda. It is 20 to 200 kilometers from the capital city, where is the what was the cradle of the Catholicism during the communist time. Mm. In Karaganda there is uh, um, the, the former concentration camp where so many priests suffered. Mm. And there is the Cathedral of Our Lady of Fatima, mm. uh, and so on. So you are welcome always. Yeah, like like I said, I I know I've spent just a little bit of time in Almaty, um, but spent most of my time in in Octal. But um, yeah, maybe I'll make it to Estonia uh, someday while you're there and be able to uh, cele celebrate Mass with you. I uh, and you know you were talking about your other book, Christus Vincent, and to this day, I read it a couple years ago or a year ago, however long it's been. And to this day, I still frequently think about your story that you share about growing up under the communist rule and how when you came out, you were surprised with some of the changes in in, in the liturgy, particularly with communion in the hand. Um, that that is a story that has that has stuck with me in my personal life quite frequently, actually. Yes, it was. Um... For me, I repeat, and I will continuously repeat, the deepest wound in the church today is the communion in hand. We have to state this, mm -hmm. to stress this. It is our Lord is so trivialized, so mm -hmm. even trampled by feet in the churches through this practice. The, the lay people, they are not responsible, lastly. It is the clergy. And the Pope, we have to stop this immediately. We cannot continue to, tre to treat our Lord in such a superficial manner, uh, like candies and cakes. Uh, right. It is impossible. There will no um, renewal of the Church unless we will stop with the communion in hand and kneel down and adore our Lord and give Him all the glory which he merits as, as our Lord and, and Savior. Here, here. I, I agree 100% with you. Um, Your Excellency, if we could impose upon you for just one more favor, would you uh, be available to dispense the apostolic blessing to uh, to us and our listeners as we part? Um, that, that would be wonderful. Yes, with much pleasure. And I would like to bless you, my dear uh, Mark and Jason. I'm so as a bishop, happy that so young man, young family man, this is a hope for the church. And this is for me a sign of the Holy Spirit working in the church to awakening so many young people, young men especially, and, and fathers of the families who are committed to the Catholic faith. And so, and I would like to bless all the other, your friends, your families who are helping you and your children, that God will bless them all that maybe one from these families will 
become holy priests also. Amen. Amen. Dominus vobiscum. Et cum spiritual. Et benedictio Dei omnipotentis Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti descendat super vos, et maneat semper. Amen. 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 Your, uh, Your Excellency, thank you again for your time, and thank you so much for this wonderful book. The book is called The Springtime That Never Came by Bishop Athanasius Schneider in conversation with Pavel Litsky. Uh, it is available at Sophia Press. There will be a link in the description uh, for you to purchase this book. You need to purchase this book. You need to read it. It is, um, you know, that we, we read in our, we read in the gospel how our Lord said, which, which of you would your father give you a stone if you needed bread? This book is bread, especially right now. And so, uh, I want to thank you so much for, uh, for your time, for your blessing, and for your cooperation with God's grace. You are doing the work of the Lord, sir, and don't let anybody stop you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, everyone. God bless you.